get the PowerPoint written down. I want to thank Swamiji for taking us into such a wonderful, spacious place. It was a little disorienting for me because I went so deep with him that when he was finishing, I suddenly realized, oh, I have a talk to give. I also would like to mention that the cosmology that emerges in psychedelic research is not a new cosmology. It's the same cosmology that has been discovered and emerges in the deepest and the best mystical traditions around the world. We are simply looking at a new set of technology, a new set of techniques for entering into these states of consciousness. It's a pleasure to be with the Time Waiver community again. When I was with you last year, I spoke to you about a book I was writing called Diamonds from Heaven. This book has now been finished and it will be released this coming November. The publisher has given it a new title. Let's see. Oh, here it is. Calling it LSD in the Mind of the Universe. It's not my favorite title. It will always be Diamonds from Heaven for me. A revolution begins with the question, what is it possible for human beings to experience? The work in the Global Consciousness Project is pushing the edges of what is it possible for human beings to experience? Parapsychological research pushes that question. Psychedelic research pushes that question. What is it possible for human beings to experience? The uh, forward to this book was written by Urban Laszlo, who I'm so pleased is going to be with us this afternoon uh, uh, by, by television. Um, it is Urban's work to provide through his mastery of multiple scientific disciplines to demonstrate that there is a super implicate, super coherent cosmic intelligence that informs time and space. It's my experience and my contention that psychedelics, when they are used in a disciplined and therapeutically structured environment, they give us the opportunity to enter into a progressively deepening experience, a deepening communion with this cosmic intelligence. Now, as you all know here, there is a revolution, a renaissance in psychedelic research taking place across the world. Uh, most psychedelic research today is taking place in two forms or is focused in two projects. One of them is mapping the neurology and the uh, biochemical pathways that psychedelics activate and the second is healing the personal psyche, the wounds that we collect in life, post-traumatic stress, depression, a variety of different conditions. I think these are important first steps in reclaiming these valuable substances, but these are only the first steps. Historically and cross-culturally, our experience with these mind-opening substances has been that healing the personal unconscious is only the first stage of a much longer journey. The psychedelic, acts, the psychedelic agents we have access to today are so powerful that I believe they mark a new frontier in human experience. We can shatter the shell of the earthbound mind so consistently that it becomes hard to describe the depths of cosmic communion that follow. By taking our life to its limits and repeatedly shattering those limits, we dissolve for hours at a time into flows of life that transcend all measures. By entering these states with focus and clear intent, by submitting to the harsh demands of death and rebirth, we surrender all we have been to become something utterly new for six or eight hours at a time. A being 
who can do things we could never do, a being who can know things that we could never know. As we enter larger and older levels of existence, the universe receives us and tutors us. It rewards our courage with exquisite intimacies, drawing us into almost unspeakable ecstasies of discovery. Now, my own psychedelic journey began 40 years when I was a brand new academic, fresh out of graduate school, and I met the work of Stanislav Grof, and I read these two early books by him, Realms of the Human Unconscious, which was published in 1976, and for me, I'm reading this in 1979, and then quickly followed by LSD Psychotherapy, where he sets out the methodology of working clinically, therapeutically, and in a very disciplined, structured manner with psychedelics and integrating them into the therapeutic process. I want to emphasize that what I'm describing today is not tripping. It's not the recreational use of psychedelics. It's not the careless engaging of uh, these states of consciousness. These are amplifiers of consciousness. And when we contain that amplified consciousness, when we take it into a meditational situation, when we take it into a kiva, completely isolated from the outside world, and use this energy to drive deeper and deeper and deeper into consciousness, that's what I'm talking about. That's what Stan Groff's work is, is exploring. So first, let me say a few words about the protocol that I used, and then describe where this journey that I'm telling the story of in LSD in the Mind of the Universe, where it went. Most of you who know Stan Groff's work, and I have to assume a certain familiarity here, most of you who know Stan Groff's work know that the fundamental distinction he drew in their methodology was low-dose psycholytic therapy and high-dose psychedelic therapy. Psycholytic therapy was basically working with lower doses of psychedelics, maybe up to between 40 and 100 sessions, where you peel the unconscious layer by layer, stripping down the various levels of trauma or angst or, uh, or pains that we carry, bit by bit. In Spring Grove Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, they developed a different form of therapy, high-dose psychedelic therapy, but the strategy was quite different. There, the strategy was to take an overwhelming dose, a very high-level dose of psychedelics, about 500 micrograms, and blow through all the levels of consciousness and try to trigger a near-death experience. They were working with patients who were going to die, terminally, cancer, terminally ill cancer patients, and they wanted to see if they could trigger a confrontation with the universe that would give them a glimpse of where they were going and so re re uh, reduce the anxiety of death. And they succeeded in doing so. Now I came along and I thought, well, if you could use psychedelics in this manner safely three times, and their protocol was limited to a maximum of three doses per patient, if you could do this work safely three times, then you could do it safely more than three times. And that's what I set out to do. I began a quiet, covert, because I couldn't do this work legally, I had to kind of create a barrier between my professional life as a professor of religious studies and my personal life, where I began this systematic work of exploring my own consciousness using uh, Stan Groff's protocols in psychedelic therapy. It ended up being 73 high-dose sessions. I worked at 500 to 600 micrograms, spread over 20 years. I did four years of work. I stopped for six years for reasons that I explain in the book. And then I did another 10 years of very intense work. I did this all between the time when I was 30 years old and 50 years old. I stopped in 1999. And it's taken me this long to digest everything that I had experienced, to put it in an organized fashion, and to basically write it down in a way that I could share it with other people. And it's not that, what's not important is that I experience these things. What's important is that these levels of consciousness are available for everyone to experience, 
whether through psychedelics or through non-psychedelics, because it's the nature of the universe itself. I want to emphasize that I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a therapist. I didn't go into this work seeking healing, though I received much healing. I'm a philosopher. I was trained as a philosopher. And I had a philosophical agenda. And in this, I traced this work back to William James in his Varieties of Religious Experience, where he talks about his experiences with nitrous oxide. And the essence of this new philosophical modality is this. First, three steps. First, to push the boundaries of consciousness as hard as possible, or to push the boundaries of consciousness. Second, to write a detailed and complete, phenomenologically accurate report of your experience within 24 hours. And third, critically analyze your experience, comparing it to other, form, other bodies of knowledge and comparing it to the experiences of other journeyers. So a few words on the methodology. Oh, I tried there, but I, I stopped. <laughs> When I got to the end of my 73 journeys and was beginning to write it up, in the beginning I thought I was really just doing an extended course of psychedelic therapy. It was just psychedelic therapy, nothing new. When I got to the end and I was looking back over the course of where I went over those 20 years, I realized that this was something different. When you enter into this state so many times in a controlled fashion, it opens up opportunities that were not considered in the early years of psychedelic therapy, and it also represents challenges that were not encountered in the early years of psychedelic therapy. I recognize that it, it needed a new name, it needed something to differentiate it, and so the name I gave it is psychedelic exploration. The method is psychedelic therapy. Very controlled circumstances, always working with a sitter, always working con in contained and private environment, eye shades, earphones, listening to a very carefully curated musical list. The difference between psychedelic therapy and psychedelic exploration is the number of sessions. For me, 73 sessions. Now, I want to add that this is not a protocol that I recommend. Honestly, I do not. At the time, I thought I could do this work safely, and I did do it safely. I always stayed within the limits of safety. But I found that pushing yourself that hard, that deeply, into the universe generated complications that it took all of my resources to manage in the course of this time. If I were doing this work over again, I would be much gentler on myself. I would balance high-dose sessions with low-dose sessions. And because LSD tends to be a high-altitude psychedelic, I would balance working with LSD with working with psilocybin and ayahuasca, which are more body-grounded psychedelics. I think a more nuanced approach uh, would produce better results. Now, I did this work as systematically as I could. I had very, very detailed records came out with about 400 pages of my psychedelic journal. I kept track of all the dates, of course, of my sessions. I even looked at the astrological variables when I began to understand from Stan and from Rick Tarnas their proposal that there is a correlation between the outer planets and what happens in one's psychedelic sessions. And I should mention that my protocol was highly standardized, which allowed me to minimize as many variables as possible. I always had the same sitter, who was a clinical psychologist, whom I happened to be married to at the time, it was very handy, the same set and setting, the same location, the same substance, the same dose level, and the same recording process. And I think the stability of all those variables, keeping them constant, it, it contributed to the clarity and the stability of the communion that opened and the psychedelic window that opened in this work. Now, I want to mention that the story in Diamonds from Heaven, I always 
To me, it's Diamonds from Heaven. The story that opened is not primarily a personal story. I did not, I'm not trying to tell a personal story. In fact, I dropped out a lot of the personal details. It's a personal story, of course, because it's my experience, but it's not primarily a personal story. These waves represent a series of psychedelic sessions which I've drawn overlapping to illustrate the point that these sessions are systematically, there is a conversation that picks up and continues session by session. The small circles at the beginning and endings of the, of the session represent uh, the, the openings and closing of a session. I found that things that were relevant to my personal life tended to occur when I was leaving time and space and when I was coming back into time and space. But during the peak hours of a session, after the first 12 or 15 sessions, during the peak hours of a session, I was usually operating far beyond personal reality. And that's the story which is the most important story. That's the story which is the philosophically more interesting story. That's the cosmological story. So this story is not a therapeutic story. A therapeutic story, the personal details are very important. In a cosmological story, they're less important. When one does this work, one enters into a regimen in which one undergoes many deaths and many rebirths. The first death, this line in this image, uh, everything below the line is time-space reality. The drop at the end of this line, at this Im blue image, represents our individual time-space identity, our egoic identity. The first circle represents the death-rebirth that takes place when we transition into spiritual reality, ego death, which is, gets a lot of attention in the psychedelic literature. But it's getting less attention so far are the deeper deaths that take place at deeper levels of existence. Now, Stan Groff uses the vocabulary of psychic level transpersonal experience, subtle level transpersonal experience, causal level experience. And as, because the universe tends to reveal itself in layers, one goes through deaths when one moves into these deeper layers. Every time one goes into a deeper level of consciousness, everything that one has known up until that time, including your psychedelic experiences, everything you know to be true, including those psychedelic experiences, must be surrendered if a truly new and novel dimension of existence is going to open. When I was evaluating all of my experiences, one of the questions I asked myself was, okay, there were many, many deaths, but how many fundamental core death-rebirth transitions did I go through? Oop, wrong way. Oh, back up. Hmm. One circle to describe a transition into a level of reality is an oversimplification. One goes through levels within levels within levels. These numbers represent session numbers. And there is kind of an iteration, a repeating, going deeper and deeper and deeper into this level of reality. But I asked how many times, how many core deaths, death rebirth cycles did I go through? And I identified five. And here they are. The first is the death of self the complete shattering of your time-space identity, letting go of everything you have known yourself to be from the moment you're born until that moment in time, ego death. The second was entering into or took place at the level of the collective mind, the collective psyche. The third was entering into archetypal mind, kind of the domain described by Carl Jung and Plato, but different than either of them portray it. The third, fourth, entering into causal oneness. Now oneness is a theme which emerges much earlier in the journey, but causal oneness is something quite distinctive. There is no outer boundary at the level of causal oneness. It is the totality of existence. You cannot step outside this reality to get a perspective on it. It is the totality of existence moving and living as one. And the fifth level for me is the diamond luminosity, what I call the domain of diamond luminosity, which occupied me for the last five years of my journey. 
Now, what I'd like to do now is shift to the book and simply uh, take you through or show you the relationship between these stages and the chapters of the book. And the easiest way to do this is just do it maybe something like this. To the death of self, there is the chapter crossing the boundary of birth and death. There's a methodology chapter first explaining the methodology and the protocol, but then crossing the boundary of birth and death. Exploring collective mind, there are three chapters that address this. The first has to do with the ocean of suffering. The second is deep time in the soul, or the fifth chapter, deep time in the soul. And the sixth is initiation into the universe. I'm going to come back, so I'm just going to push through here. Archetypal mind, there is a chapter called the greater real of archetypal reality. Causal oneness, there is a chapter that I call a benediction of blessings. Diamond luminosity is discussed in chapter 10, which is the largest number of sessions in the book, 26 sessions, almost a third of the entire journey. But before I talk about diamond luminosity, I talk about the birth of the future human which I have to drop back, and this is a series of experiences that actually began during the initiation of the universe and continued into the diamond luminosity work. And at the end, after everything was said and done, when I was in the last year of this work, a final vision, which was the capstone of the birth of the future human work. So it's impossible to do more than just touch on a few themes, a few descriptors, of these chapters to give a sense of the trajectory of the work. So first let's do that, and then let's move this over. Crossing the boundary of birth and death is the easiest to summarize because it's the one that's very thoroughly described in Stanislav Grof's work. It's the perinatal level of consciousness entering and transitioning through the perinatal level when one enters this work, one becomes, many people relive their own birth. One has many profound encounters with death, death and dying. We get here by being born. We leave the physical world by dying. When one is pushing the boundaries and taking consciousness beyond the limits of physical consciousness, birth and death get all complexly intertwined until one goes through a series of profound existential crises, confronting the meaninglessness of existence, the futility of life understood as a physical, purely a physical structure, until eventually one goes through an event that usually is described as ego death. In the ninth and tenth sessions, this took me two years and ten sessions to navigate this process. In the end, the universe just snapped me like a twig. It, everything I knew myself to, do, to be at the beginning of the day was completely reversed and inverted. I began the day as a white, male, middle-class philosopher obsessed with the meaning of life. In the course of the session, for hours, I was immersed in the experience of women, women of color, women who were poor, women who had no interest whatsoever in philosophical uh, exploration. And that's what I was, that's what I became. It was a frightening experience, scared me to death. But when I let go, and when I allowed myself to become fully a woman, then everything pivoted, and I was taken into the world of women. I experienced hundreds and hundreds of women. I experienced many dimensions of female experience under the arm of the Great Mother. I wish every man could have the experience that I had that day. It truly was a broadening experience. And the message was not reclaim your femininity or reclaim your former lives as women, because I know I've had former lives as women. The message was where you are going, gender does not exist, let go. Excuse me.
where things went next when I went through ego death and I was expecting things to get lighter I mean after ego death things are supposed to get lighter where things went actually got much worse I entered a domain of extraordinary suffering collective suffering a domain of, of just unbelievable pain and unbelievable anger and violence and it this took place over two years and it deepened systematically systematically deepening and deepening deepening until eventually I had the experience of being becoming in some fundamental way all of the human beings of our entire species and gathering experiences that extended over a hundred thousand years just a massive at first I thought I, this was a deepening of ego death that somehow pieces of my ego had slipped through the noose and there was I was dying it was my personal death and personal transformation that was driving these processes but it went on for so long and it took so many it, it, there were so many beings involved that eventually I came to a different conclusion the conclusion I came to was that somehow something had shifted in my sessions and the universe was using my sessions to bring a kind of healing to some portion of the collective psyche with Urban Laszlo I agree that there is an Akashic memory that holds the memory of everything that's happened in the universe and in the collective unconscious of our species we hold the entire history of our species we hold all the wars we hold the memory of all the terrible things that we've done to each other and just as our personal trauma burdens our personal life and must be cleansed if our personal life is to be free likewise our species holds these wounds and these wounds these these trauma must be cleansed if our species is going to function at a higher level so I came to understand by the end of this process that something was working to transform not me but through me to, to transform some aspect of the human species and help us move forward now there are two phases of a session in working like this there's a purification phase and then there's an ecstatic phase in the purification or suffering phase if you allow it if you take it as let it take you as far as it wants to take you if you let it take you wherever it wants to go even though you may not understand anything about what's happening it will eventually culminate come to a crescendo and it'll you'll go through a kind of a death and surrender process and when you go through that you wake up into a completely different reality completely unexpected reality and for the remainder of the session you're in an ecstatic state of consciousness and then when you resume the next session three or four months later the same process will repeat itself when I came through the ocean of suffering let me back up just a second I did the ocean of suffering I said lasted two years there was a year of work and then I stopped my work for six years and then I resumed my work on the other side in the first year when I was going through the ocean of suffering when I came through the sessions I entered this territory that I call deep time in the soul I entered systematically for seven sessions over the course of the year I entered into a state of consciousness in which I experienced the totality of my life start to finish as a completed whole all the details of my life were suddenly present I was in the state that just totally overwhelmed me and systematically gave me an instruction on what my life was about how it was connected to the lives of the people around me this was the deepest most moving experience of my life at the time and yet at the in the first time when I came back from that experience I could not remember it it disappeared I had no reference points in my time space consciousness to enter states of to anchor states of consciousness which shatter time space or linear time but what I found was 
that when I went back to this condition in that state of consciousness a second, third, and fourth time, I remembered more. I was able to hold on to more. I'd get more coherent, a clearer understanding of what was taking place. You can learn how to stay conscious in levels of consciousness that you were not able to stay conscious in before. And this is an epistemological, an important epistemological state. Deep experiences of the universe are not simply given to you. First, you have to get to that level of reality to have these experiences, but then you have to train yourself. You have to be taught by the universe how to stay conscious in levels of consciousness that previously you would not be able to stay conscious in. It takes a great deal of discipline and training, and the universe will train you to have accurate recall of levels of consciousness that were previously completely novel to you. After the six-year break that I took, and I began the work again, the ocean of consciousness began exactly where it had stopped six years before. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. The fact that it started exactly where it had stopped before, I think, says something about the intentionality and the, uh, and the, the magnitude of the intelligence that is guiding one's work. I always felt myself to be in communion with an intelligence. This intelligence never took any form. I never saw any images that I would associate with it. There were no deities or no forms of anything like that. But I always felt myself in dialogue with a superordinate intelligence. When I began the work after the six year break, the ecstatic portion of the session shifted into a completely different domain. I entered into a process in which I was given a systematic course of instruction in the structure of reality at a cosmological level. I know this sounds terribly arrogant and I apologize for that, but that's simply what happened. Here are the names of the sessions that I use, that I, that I gave these sessions and I deal with in the book. For me, I give all of my sessions a name. I try to identify the pith of what happens in the session, and I give it a name so that when I see the name, it reminds me of the session, because I'm trying to hold all of my journey in my mind all at the same time. I not only record my sessions, I break them down into bullet points. These are the names of the sessions that I'm addressing in the chapter of the initiation into the universe. Some of these I discuss in my book, Dark Night, Early Dawn. The master plan was a series of experiences that took place which began, and this, this continued for years, a series of experiences in which I seemed to be being taught what was happening to the human race and where the human race was going. What is the larger developmental trajectory of humanity. Once again, I apologize for the apparent arrogance of that. It sounds like ego run amok, but eventually the ocean of suffering culminated in the 24th century, what I, it's a 24th session, which I call healing the collective wound, just an, an orgy of suffering, which eventually when it came to a head and it, it climaxed, it spun me into a level of reality that was ancient beyond reckoning. It spun me into archetypal reality and the collective suffering never reappeared in any subsequent session. Where I went next was into the greater real of archetypal reality. I entered a reality that was more real than physical reality. It was like Plato's, in Plato's cave, where the fellow gets out of Plato caves, in Plato's cave, the cave and enters a world which is more real than physical reality, which is a very disorienting experience initially. And when I entered this reality, when I entered archetypal reality for the next year and a half, I, I stayed in this reality over in my sessions, I went through a death that was deeper than ego death. 
I went through a death in which I had to cease to be a human being in any way, shape, or form. My consciousness could no longer operate within the confines of even our collective psyche. I entered a state of awareness which was beyond the collective psyche, and it, at that level I was being worked with to be taught how reality functions at this level. The experiences, the sessions that I address in this chapter are listed here. My experiences here are sort of divided into two levels. There was kind of at the high subtle level, the platonic level in which I encountered archetypal forms, archetypal beings that were just vast. They were impossible for my mind to wrap itself around. I imaged them as galaxies. They were you know, billions and billions of light years across, just impossible to imagine beings of such magnitude. But these are beings who are the beings who are responsible for creating time and space itself, beings who are responsible for creating and governing the emergence of life inside time and space. At a lower level, at a lower subtle level, I entered deep into the collective psyche and I repeatedly had the experience of the human species as a single organism and that all of our individual minds were fractal aspects of its comprehensive mind. And even our bodies were cells within the unified body of humanity. And that as we heal our minds and as we heal our bodies, we actually contribute to the developmental history and the strengthening of the mind of our species and even the body of our species. When I went into archetypal reality, the deaths that I went through involved enormous energy, uh, fire, volcanoes, sun flares, just excruciatingly difficult uh, experiences of being burned alive and being consumed at this deep level. And this, I mention this because this is an important point. What I learned was that as you go deeper into the universe, every deeper level of reality functions at a higher level of energy. This is well recognized in the deep mystical traditions. A deeper level of consciousness is a higher level of energy. And if you are going to have stable experience at that deeper level of consciousness, you must stabilize your consciousness at that higher level of energy. If you're mountain climbing, you have to stabilize dealing with less and less oxygen. And you do that gradually in your ascent. But if you're working in deep, non-ordinary states of consciousness, you must stabilize and accommodate to greater and greater levels of energy. And you must learn how to manage those, that level of energy. Otherwise, your experiences there will be fragmented, incoherent, and you will not be able to bring back much of great detail. I began to have experiences here of reincarnation as a collective phenomenon. Now, I had previously, I've written a book on reincarnation, and the story I tell there is that reincarnation is kind of a, an, I thought of it as an individual soul story, that that's the story that's given in our spiritual traditions, that we are learning, hopefully we're making progress, we die, we're reborn, we die and reborn, and our individual choices lead to hopefully an improving destiny as our soul matures. But now I began to have experiences of the entire planet as a single organism growing itself, maturing itself through the pulsating rhythm of its entire population reincarnating century after century. And I began to understand or, have, or was shown that our individual karma is all integrated and part of our collective karma and the boundary between individual karma and individual evolution and our collective karma and our collective in evolution came down entirely. And that's the primary theme of Dark Night, Early Dawn, that there isn't a separate, it's impossible to achieve spiritual awakening by yourself because there is no private self to awaken. 
All of our awakening emerges out of a collective context and it contributes back into the collective context. In the end, we are always working with the divine for the good of the entire species and beyond the species. After the time spent in the uh, in the uh, where am I? Yeah, in the greater real of archetypal reality, I entered causal oneness. I entered into a period of tremendous blessings. It was a year of unbelievable blessings. These are the four sessions that I address in this chapter. The forest was an experience of emptiness, shunyata, complete transparency, no self in me, no self anywhere in the world around me. The entire world is a living oneness, and when you experience oneness, then you instantly experience no self, the absence of an independent, separate, autonomous self. When the self goes, the world is one. Let me jump over the, the diamond, the birth of the diamond soul. Singing the universal way was an experience of the deep, fertile void, uh, the primal void of not, of, that is the matrix within which all form emerges. Jesus' blood was an experience of uh, extraordinary cosmic love being just awash with love like I had never known anywhere in my life or anywhere in my previous sessions. But let me just mention diamonds, the birth of the diamond soul because it comes up later. In this experience, in this session, I had the experience of my former lives coming in fast and furious. I've done a lot of work through hypnosis and whatnot on my former lives and Previously, I had experienced my life 11 years before as a totality from end to beginning to end. But in this session, my former lives were coming in and they were like wrapping kite string around a kite spool, uh, except that what the, the lies were like filaments of light and just wrapping them around and around. And suddenly, they seemed to hit a critical mass. And when they hit a critical mass, they fused. And when they fused, there was an explosion of light, a, an extraordinary diamond-like light broke out of my chest. And I was thrown into a state of consciousness that was both individual, but a higher level of individuality than anything I had ever known. And I think what I was being shown in this experience, what I was being given in this experience, was a taste of where reincarnation is taking us. Reincarnation doesn't just result in the development of a little bit better this life, a little bit better the next life, acquiring more, more moral insight, more talents, more this, more that. Eventually, sooner or later, all of our experiences, all that we have lived and learned in all of our different lives, eventually all those experiences which we remember when we die, in this, you know, we die, we expand into the soul, we come back into egoic awareness, we expand into the soul, back into egoic awareness. Eventually, sooner or later, all of our life experience is integrated as a singular individuality inside time and space. We wake up. We wake up to the cosmic beings that we are, that we truly are. We no longer attempted to identify strictly with our body, with our time-space body. From here, the work went into the diamond luminosity work. But before I go into that, I need to backtrack a little bit and talk about the birth of the future human. I mentioned that in the initiation of the universe work, I started having a series of visions about the evolution of humanity. Now, this sounds ridiculous at one level, but it's not ridiculous from within the context of transpersonal psychology. When you shatter your individual consciousness, 
you don't simply flip into totality of oneness consciousness, but you open into a multi-layered experience, a multi-layered universe, and one of the layers of that universe is the consciousness of our species. And when you open to the consciousness of your species, it's only natural that you would get insights into the growth of this species, where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. In my sessions over five years, I was given repeatedly the same kind of story, the same story, different aspects, which I address in this chapter. I gathered all the different visions having to do with the future of humanity into this chapter. The first is the visions of awakening, six visions describing a profound awakening of the human psyche and the human heart. A profound, what I call the great awakening, an awakening of uh, a shift in the fundamental architecture of the collective unconscious. A year and a half later, after those first series of sessions, I was taken deep into deep time, beyond personal deep time, deep into collective deep time, and I was taken into what appeared to be the death and rebirth of our species in the near future. I experienced this, I didn't, wasn't given any information about how or when or why, except that it would seem to be triggered. There was a global systems crisis that seemed to be being triggered by a global ecological crisis. I was given, I experienced the fact of this transformation, and I experienced, I was given a lot of insights into some of the mechanisms of how we would make this transition as quickly as we need to do it. We have so little time to make the transition, and it has to do with understanding the collective psyche. It has to do with understanding that our collective unconscious is a field, and that when this field is hyperstimulated with the suffering that we are entering into, it becomes so hyperstimulated and it enters into nonlinear or far from equilibrium conditions, and that there is a certain structural parallel between what can happen in a psychic field when it is pushed into nonlinear conditions and what happens in physical fields when they are pushed into nonlinear conditions. And we can extrapolate some of the insights from, from physical fields and understand what might happen in a psychic field when it is pushed into nonlinear conditions. Specifically, the capacity for rapid accelerated change heightened creativity, and the emergence of a higher self-organization. In my visions, in my sessions, it was always, this is going to happen faster than anyone can imagine, faster than you can imagine, faster than you can imagine. The, the pace of our development in the past was irrelevant to the pace of our development in the future. And it has to do with what's happening at a deep collective psychic level. From here, I went into the diamond luminosity work, five years of entering progressively, entering into a field of consciousness that was completely empty, devoid of content, and clear, clear beyond imagination, just clear, clear, breathtakingly luminescent. Buddhism calls this dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute reality the clear light from which physical reality springs. I called it diamond luminosity. My time is running short. I can only go through so much because I take comfort that all of this is in the book and you'll be able to go into greater detail when you see it. out of these four sessions, and I went into this reality only four times in five years. Five years of work to spend four days in this condition. It was a high cost to pay. In between these four sessions, as you might imagine, there was intense episodes of purification, more purification, more purification. 
Because when you, just to touch this reality, to be able to return to it and have stable experience in this reality, you have to purify yourself of anything in you which is less than this reality. The first two entries into the Diamond Luminosity took place in sessions 45 and 50. And then after that, we didn't go deeper, it didn't go deeper into the Diamond Luminosity, but the Diamond Luminosity began to crunch itself deeper into my physical body. It, went th it, it was as if this light was restructuring my biology. It was restructuring my mind, my emotions, my subtle energy system, and actually restructuring my cellular, and that cellular anatomy in ways that I won't, couldn't begin to understand. But it was soaking itself deeper into my physical presence. And I learned from these experiences that the purpose of this work was not simply to ex move into transcendence. It isn't to go into some disembodied, transcendent reality. These fields are beautiful, they're magnificent. But the goal of the work was not transcendence, ultimately. The goal was to bring this reality deeper into our physical existence, to let as much of spiritual reality as possible enter into our physical awareness and to transform our lives so that we become an integrated whole, a being that balances spiritual reality and access to spirituality and the magnificent universe which has been gestated inside spiritual reality, the reality of time and space. At the end, in the very last year of this work, I was given one final vision that was the capstone of everything that had gone on before. In this final vision, the universe put me through the absolute worst stripped down process that it had ever put me through before. It was just a cascading, absolute loss of control, stripped down, dying, dying, growing deeper and deeper and deeper, until eventually it spun me into deeper into deep time than I had ever been before. And I haven't even tried to explain what deep time is, but again, it's in the book. It took me into a state of consciousness in which I was able to experience 100,000 years kind of as a simultaneous present. I began to experience time in terms of the dying of whole uh, life as a pulsation of death and rebirth of whole, I experienced whole generations dying every few seconds, being born and dying every few seconds, just a, a radical expansion of the time frame. This, I was given an experience of what the Buddhists would call samsara in the raw. Everything in this world being born, dying, conserving, growing, integrating, being born, dying. And in this context, I was given three teachings which I'll just mention. The first was that it showed me that human beings are actually built for speed. We are built for accelerated evolution. And it has to do with the fact that each of our lives are, are so short, a hundred years, merely a hundred years, but underneath this repeated reincarnation, there is a gathering of our knowledge, a gathering of our, of our experience. And periodically, this gathered knowledge flips and becomes a new foundation for all subsequent incarnations. And from this expanded time horizon, I, was, I could see that human beings were actually designed for accelerated evolution. We have a tendency to think human nature this, human nature that, too statically. We have to think more dynamically, more open-endedly, in terms, if we want to experience ourselves and experience the human race from the perspective of the creative intelligence, it's behind it all. The other two experiences I'll mention was I experienced the universe as a diamond maker. I experienced this reincarnational, these, these, the cycling of reincarnation, and I experienced sparks of diamond light shooting off periodically into the deep space, into the deep sky. And I understood that the universe is making diamonds. 
and the diamonds, the distillation of all of our experience here into these crystalline, pure forms that allow us to enter into dimensions of spiritual reality that we could never survive in if we hadn't gone through this hyper-concentration, hyper-accelerated developmental process which is taking place inside time and space. And lastly, I was given an experience of the future human, taken deep and ex allowed to experience for a short period of time the human being that nature is giving birth to in this long developmental process. Such an exquisite being, just touching it for only a few minutes, so helpful, just totally expanded my understanding of human potential and showed us it's very important, I think, that we have an understanding, that we have a vision of where we are going historically. Because as the shadows darken, as we enter deeper into this historical crisis that we are entering into now, as we enter the dark night of our collective soul, we could lose hope. We could think that it's all over. We could think that we are somehow being punished for the sins of our past. We could think that it's just we're entering into an extinction event, but really we are in labor. We have been gestating for hundreds of thousands of years. Nature has been gestating us. Gestation is a long process. Birth is a relatively short process. Labor is a very, very intense and painful process, but at the end it gives birth to something wonderful, something new. I think that's what's happening historically. After hundreds of thousands of years, we are entering into labor. And the crisis that we are entering at a global stage is synchronistically connected to a developmental crisis that is taking place inside each one of us. We carry the entire history of the world in our former lives, in our heart, in our soul. As the planet is struggling to become one in everything that that involves, we are working to become one coherent, integrated soul so that there is a relationship between this building tension in the global order and a building tension inside our psychological order as we give birth to a new species on this planet and as we give birth to a new center of consciousness within our own person. Again, what is important is not that I had these experiences, and I could be wrong on many different levels, but what I think is important is that many, many people are having these experiences, as Stan Groff has documented. And what's important is that these levels of consciousness are there for all of us to explore. And again, I do not recommend that people explore them as I explored them. I truly don't. I would not wish anyone to go through some of the things I went through in order to enter these domains. I would be gentler. I would be, use a wider complement of experiences, of techniques and technologies. But they are there, and they are there for us to explore. There is this massive information field which we can enter suddenly and temporarily, or we can just sit here and open up and let it enter us and soak into our bones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.